How about that for an acronym? And uh, I hope that beat puts me in a good rhythm for preaching today. You can't talk about joy without a good beat. I know we're Nazarene, but it's okay to dance and rejoice in the Lord once in a while, get excited. We have a lot to be thankful for today. And uh, I'm thankful for you. I'm so glad you're here today to hear about this most important emotion as we wrap up this series on emotions. We want to talk about the one emotion today in joy that Christ wants us to most camp out in, to be regularly feeling from a day-to-day basis. But it's going to be intentional. It's not going to happen by accident. And I want to empower you today to know that you have a choice in this emotion of joy. That this is something that God has uh, presented a way for each one of us to take hold of and to set our will to. And that's the good news, is that we have a choice in it. But because Jesus wants us to primarily hang out here, knowing that when our hearts are merry and full of joy in who He is and what He's done, we naturally are going to be a good witness for Him because people are going to want to know what we have. And it's not just that we're uh, on a drug or on a high, but we can point to the person of Jesus Christ and His love in us, His work in us. Uh, For that reason, this area of joy is what's most under attack in your life spiritually. You need to understand that. That the Bible tells us we have an enemy in the spiritual realm who combats against us, who's trying to get us discontented, trying to make us very negative in spirit. The thing that he fears the most is a church that's full of joy in the Lord. That is what is most under attack for each one of us. Satan wants nothing more than for us to get our eyes off of who Jesus is and the person of Jesus and get us so busy that we don't have time to participate in his life so that we will live a life that's negative, a life that's full of anger or sadness or bitterness. And so I hope that you'll really pay attention today as we talk about this emotion of joy, not in a superficial way, but a joy that's a sincere conviction and experience of the heart. And I just want to quickly make note of this one thing. A lot of people don't think joy is connected to emotion at all. If you look it up on the internet, in fact, there's 17,000 places on the internet uh, that I at least read an article about that say that joy has, isn't really an emotion. But great preachers like Jonathan Edwards and Charles Spurgeon actually bring out from the Hebrew text especially in the Old Testament that happiness and joy are not to be pitted against one another. That scriptures are regularly uh, bringing parallel to gladness and joy. That they're being used synonymously in in places like Isaiah 35.10 and Jeremiah 31.13. There's of course different types of joy and happiness. There's a fleeting joy and happiness that comes from sin. That's why sin is a temptation, is because there's a certain joy in it. If we're honest, all of us, uh, we have partaken of sin. We've bitten the forbidden fruit, if you will. We have not followed God's instruction. And the reason we've done it is because there's a certain joy or happiness that's connected to it. But it's temporary and always leads to bad consequence. It always ends in death in our relationship with God and death in relationship to one another. That's why God says, don't do it. So there's a bad kind of joy and happiness, but then there's a good kind of joy and happiness when we choose to initially deny those temptations that God says not to do and choose to do His will that come on the back end of obedience. Isn't that interesting that a lot of times joy and happiness can come with sin up front initially but end in sorrow and sadness, fear and anger? But when we deny ourselves up front, emotions that might want to partake of sin on the back end of obedience floods, joy comes flooding in 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 the reminder that God is pleased with us and ministers to our heart that way. So joy and happiness, these are things that God wants for his people. And thankfully for us, Jesus couldn't be clearer in how it is that we can primarily live there. 
And so we're going to look together in the most clear statement Jesus makes about living in a place of joy in John chapter 15, starting in verse 4, read through verse 14, and then taking one section uh, from John 16 that follows. So if you want to follow along, you can follow along in the overhead with me here as we read. And I'm reading from the NIV version, where Jesus says this to his disciples, and he's saying it to you and I today. He says, remain in me. As I also remain in you, no branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine in order to have life that will produce fruit. In the same way, then, Jesus points out, you cannot bear fruit unless you remain in me. In other words, you can't produce godliness, godlike characteristics, such as love, joy, and peace, patience, and kindness, apart from participating in my life, connecting with me. But he says, if you will remain in me, I will remain in you, and you will bear much fruit. It's a guarantee. If you remain in Christ, you will bear the fruit of the Spirit. You will bear the life of God. You will be an image bearer. It's a guarantee. But if you get disconnected from me, you can't do it. In and of yourself, you can't produce the life of God in and of yourself. It's impossible. In fact, if you don't remain in me, you're, you become like a branch that's thrown away and you just wither up. The life of God that was maybe at one time in you begins to dry up and wither out and you lose the joy of the Lord and you lose happiness and you're just autonomous from God and you're just doing it in your own strength and it's a dry and miserable place to be. What a picture he paints for us here. But if you remain in me, verse 7, my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. Now, I just want to point out here, why would Jesus say my words need to remain in you? Well, very plainly, you, you need words to obey. How, you, how can you obey something you don't know? And he says then, this is to my Father's glory. This is how you honor God with your life and, and make him a, as glorious as he is. You bear my life. You bear much fruit. You, you bear my characteristics. You reflect me. And that shows that you're truly my disciples. It goes on in verse 9 then to say, As the Father has loved me, I have loved you. Now remain, or I would say it this way, participate in my love. Verse 10, if you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this, for what reason? Say it with me. So that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be complete. What Jesus is saying here is, I want your joy full to the brim overflowing isn't that good news today so he says here's how you get here here's my command my command is this i i want it to make it as obvious as i possibly can i'm not trying to hide it from you love each other as i have loved you greater love has no one than this that you would lay down your life for a friend you are my friends if, notice all the conditional statements Jesus is making here, you are my friends if you do what I command. Now listen to what he says in John 16, 21 through 24 about joy. A woman giving birth to a child has pain because her time has come. But when her baby is born, she forgets the anguish of the birthing process because of the joy of the child being handed to her and born into the world. So in the same way with you, he says... Now is your time of grief, but I will see you again and you will rejoice and no one will take away your joy from you. In that day, you will no longer ask me anything. Very truly, I tell you, my father will give you whatever you ask in my name. Until now, you have not asked for anything in my name. Ask and you will receive and your joy will be made complete or full. What an amazing section of Scripture for us to meditate on as the people of God who all want joy in our lives. So what are 
some keys that Jesus is rolling out for us here in terms of how to obtain and remain in the joy of the Lord. He says, it's going to be my joy in you, my joy. It's going to allow you to have a completeness of joy. He says three things here in particular that he points out for us. Number one, he talks about his words being in us. His words being a part of our thought process. Secondly, he he points out then in light of his word, asking him for things in prayer. And and when in, in a Jewish mindset, they would have connected a name with a character. Your name represented your character. And so Yeshua is this loaded term. Jesus' name is a loaded term for Savior. And, and we see these, all these names of God in the Bible that represent his character and his heart. So when he's saying, when you ask things in my name, it can be given for, to you. When you have the, the love of God in you, you're going to be asking for things that Jesus himself would ask for, which would not be self-centered or self-seeking, but rather things that you know God wants of your life that are going to bring honor to his name. The third thing he brings forth about joy is he talks about obeying his commands, which are summed up with the idea of verse 12, love each other as I have loved you. Now I want to point forth all the conditional statements that Jesus makes here. It's, it's constantly saying, if you do this, if you do that, then, then, then you will have joy. In other words, we have something to do to obtain joy. And I don't know about you, but that actually excites me. That's good news for us because that tells me that we have control over how much joy is at work in our lives. That, that people don't just stumble into joy by accident and then fall out of joy by accident. But that this is something that God is prescribing for us that we can wake up every single day and choose to walk in. And he begins with this. He says, you can decide whether or not you're going to treasure my word. Do you treasure the way that I've prescribed for you to live? That's a choice that you can make. Part of being made in the image and likeness of God is that you can choose to do your own thing. You can choose to go your own way. You don't have to prescribe to the Word of God. You can prescribe to the world's ways of living. But he says, if you want to have my joy in you, then you're going to come and you're going to have my Word as something that you treasure, that you want to live by. He says, you can decide whether or not you want to pray. He says, man, you want to have joy? Learn to ask the Father in my name for what I've prescribed for you. And you will receive it. And you will have joy as you get to see prayers answered in your life. Thirdly, we can decide whether or not we want to set our will to obeying Jesus' commands. So let me give you some practical examples of Jesus' words that he prescribes for us to live by that can add to our joy or steal from our joy as I just think about how it pertains to my own life practically and I began to meditate this week. Okay, what are, what are some joy killers in my own life that Jesus' words uh, are an ointment to or a medicine to that I can choose to live by? Well, the first example I want to bring forth is from Matthew chapter 6, verse 27 and 33 through 34. It's a long passage, and I just wanted to sum it up real neat for you. Jesus says this, Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? What good does worrying do for you? Do we have any honest Christians? Anybody here struggle with worry and anxiety and fears? Yeah, yeah, a couple of you. I'm not alone. Okay. He says then in verse 33 and 34, Seek first the kingdom of God, his rule over your life, his righteousness, his right ways of living, in other words. And he says, All your basic needs will be given to you as well. Therefore, here's the conclusion of the matter. Why are you worrying about tomorrow? Stop worrying about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Is it just me, or are you tempted to get weighed down and 
worried when you look beyond today's need and you start thinking about this coming week and this coming month and you look at all the activities and all this pressure starts to sink in and all of a sudden any joy that you have towards life turns into a lot of grumbling and complaining and worrying going, how did I end up in this place? Everybody says it all the time, don't they? I'm so busy. I'm so overwhelmed. I have a feeling like I don't have time for God or anything of the church because I'm just so busy. I'm so weighed down. Jesus tells us to allow his word to take shape and form in your life, that you have a choice to live that way, to live in that way of thinking, or you can choose to live according to his word. And he says, listen, trust, I'm a good father. I can handle tomorrow, and I'll handle next week, and I'll handle next month. You worry about just today. That's enough. And when I take one day at a time, and I just think about today's needs, and I focus on who God is and what he can help me with in today, I don't know about you, but when I can do that, when I choose to set my mind and my heart in that way, it helps ease my worry. It helps ease my pain. It helps bring joy back to say, I can handle what's before me today are you listening to jesus words another example i thought of came from uh, a book that i'm reading on uh, called a hole in our holiness with a wednesday night men's group and the author was explaining about how he overcomes lust in his life uh, specific, specifically uh, in the sexual nature of lust and he talked about the fact that he had this neighbor down the street. Can you believe this? It's like a commercial or something. That he'd be driving out at work, and there'd be this lady that was, you know, good-looking lady that he noticed one day. She would always be in a bathing suit washing her car. It's like, are you kidding me right now? Satan, get behind me, right? And so he said that what the Lord gave him was Matthew 5, 8, blessed are the pure in heart for they will see God. And so this is what he said. He said, God, I want to see you more than I want to see this woman right now. See, he was shaped by the word because the word of God was abiding in him. The Holy Spirit could take that word and put it in his heart and his mind when he was tempted to take in this image and begin to lust and begin to let his heart run wild. He chose rather to allow the word of God to have its way. And he said, he was reminded by the Holy Spirit, blessed are the pure in heart for they will see God. And I can't think of his name in the moment, but he, he just, he said, he said, he said Lord, I want to see you more than I want to see this woman. I know that if I see you, I'm going to have more joy than the temporary measure of seeing this woman. See, this is what it means to allow the word of God to abide in you and then to pray accordingly. And so he turned from looking at this woman to looking at God and his word and saying, Lord, have your way with me. Help me not to look because I want to see you and I want to keep my heart pure. He believed the, the word of God, the promises of God. And God uses him mightily. One more example for you. Actually, two more. 1 Peter 3, 9-12. through 12. This ought to hit home for all of us now. How about these words inspired by Jesus? Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. I can displace myself from the evil with evil, but the insult with insult, man, that's tough, huh? I'm really good at the volley with the insult. You insult me, whoo, look out, I can insult you back. I'm really good at identifying where to insult. On the contrary, repay evil with blessing because to this you were called so that you and may inherit a blessing. And then he quotes Psalm 34. Whoever would love life. You see, we all say, I want joy. I want to love life. Well, do you want to keep your tongue from evil? <laughs> do you want to restrain yourself in that moment when it would feel so good, when you're hurt, when your heart gets pricked with an insult, to not insult right back? You see, you want joy, but do you want the pain of denying yourself that indulgence. It goes on in verse 11. They must turn from evil and do good. They must seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. His ears are attentive to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. That sounds like Jesus back in John 15. 
When he says, if you obey my commands, you can ask for anything and it will be done for you. But if you're just insult for insult and you have no self-control and no discipline and you're not setting your heart to do the will of God, but you're just out there letting it rip like everybody else. Could it be that you're shutting down the work of God in your life in such a way that he's not going to honor your prayers? That's what Peter seems to be saying, doesn't it? He says the reason that we ought to be motivated to turn from that kind of living and we ought to be peace seekers that pursue it is because the eyes of the Lord, they're watching in those moments as to what you're going to do. Are you going to honor God? Are you going to make life about Him? Or is it going to be about you and your self-indulgence? What's it going to be? Are you going to choose life and joy? Are you going to choose death and division? You get to decide. And God is watching. I want to love life. I want to have joy. But any time I get digged, I'm going to dig back. Does our nation need to hear this right now? I don't care what you are or what your makeup is. You are made in the image and likeness of God. And if we lose our humanity and we're just going to insult each other, there's no place for that in the kingdom of God. You want to be under Christ's rule? I don't know about you. I want Jesus for president for all of eternity. And I'm not going to let temporary matters take my heart away into insult and injury and losing sight that this is a human being across from me. I don't want to lose the kingdom of God. And I'm not saying we don't need to stand strong for what we believe in. We don't need to participate. But we better guard our hearts. We better not do damage to Christ because that's an eternal kingdom. But if we are not letting the Word of God saturate our minds and our thoughts, then we're just out there a stumbling block, reckless with our words. And what I'm getting at ultimately too is how we're not only hurting God in the kingdom when we don't take seriously allowing his word to shape us and renew our minds and putting on the mind of Christ, but we hurt ourselves in our desire for joy. We're self-defeating. One last example from Ephesians 6, 7, and 8 and renewing our minds and letting the word of Christ dwell within us. Serve wholeheartedly, Paul says, as if you were serving the Lord, not people. That's the key to good service. Can I get an amen? Amen. People are always going to be joy killers if you let them. But you got to remember, you're not just serving them. You're serving them in the name of the Most High God, Jesus Christ. It's not really about them. It's about Jesus. And it's about them seeing Jesus in you. And so even if they're not putting on joy, you get to decide to put on joy and be an example to them. And here's what you can know if you believe the word of God. The Lord will do what? What will he do for us? He will reward each one for whatever good we do. For you to deny yourself in that initial moment and go ahead and put on Christ and go ahead and serve anyways as unto him regardless of how they're treating you, what can you know? He is going to reward you. Do you believe that? Do you live that? This is what it means to love each other as I have loved you, Jesus says in verse 12. This is my command. This is what I'm commanding you to do. I'm not suggesting it. I'm commanding it so you can participate in my life, so that you can have the joy of the Lord that is your strength. You cannot let anybody steal your love. Do not be overcome by evil. Overcome evil with good. Don't let this world steal your love. you got to fight the good fight of faith. It's a fight. Can I get an amen? amen? And we are way too passive about our joy. We allow our circumstances and people, and I'm preaching to myself right now, steal our joy way too easily we got to fight back against that. and say, devil, I see what you're doing. I'm not going to let you steal my joy. I'm not going to let you steal my rejoicing right now. This is the devil at work trying to discourage me, trying to steal my testimony. God is worthy of my service regardless of what anybody else is choosing to do. 
In other words, what I'm getting at is each of us has a will and we get to decide each day how we're going to set it. That's ultimately what it means to be made in the image and likeness of God. And that's what the grace of God is empowering us to do, is to set our will in accordance with God and the spirit of Christ or the devil in the spirit of Antichrist. But here's why I wanted to add from chapter 16. I think it's such a good illustration that Jesus brings forth, the, illustra- the illustration of childbirth. It's painful to get into new habits and routines, but if we really believe there's joy on the other side, we'll do it. I love the illustration of a woman giving childbirth. Not that I've experienced it, nor do I want to. If there's one reason for a man to have joy, it's that he has so little to contribute to that process of birthing a child. (laughs) And I mean that with utmost respect to you ladies. I mean, it's like, holy cow. Courtney, I thought I loved you before you gave birth to men. Now I love you on a whole new love. I cannot believe you can do that. I am such a wuss. Um... But there is pain in denying yourself to do the will of God. And, and I think that in a comfort culture, in a, cult, in a culture that just wants to cultivate comfort in everything, and it's a consumer culture, we have almost no framework for this idea that I would have to restrain myself, deny myself, um, inflict pain on myself. But the Apostle Paul says, I beat my body down daily. He says literally in the Greek, I give it a black eye as to not allow it to control my actions so that I can be controlled by the actions of Christ instead. And if you're, if you're married here, you know what I'm getting at. And if you have kids, you know what I'm getting at. Can I get an amen, right? It's painful when pain is inflicted upon you to not respond with insult and injury. It's painful to be a peacemaker who is allowing the word of Christ to have its way in the moment. But what I'm getting at when it comes to joy is the result of going ahead and looking to Christ and praying for anything in his name. He said, if you pray for it, you can have it, you can receive it, and you can know that I am an overcomer in you, that I have power for your weakness. And there is an incredible joy that comes with walking in victory in Jesus' name. See, the the emotion of joy comes on the back end of obedience. Not always on the front end. And just to reinforce this choice matter, because it's so neglected in today's theology, that, that I, you know, I just got to say it, and, and some of you are going to be insulted by this, but I swear, we, there, is a, there is a Christian culture now that is just, I, we call it Gnosticism, this idea this ethereal idea that you don't have to force yourself to do anything that's not pleasurable. That, that you can just live in your head and not embody Christ and be a Christian. That you never have to do anything unpleasant, you don't have to suffer anything at all to experience joy. That that would be antithetical to joy, when in reality, true, full joy is participating in the life of God who suffered. And the irony of the suffering is you get the child, the voice of Christ developed into fullness in your spirit, in your heart. As he whispers to you, well done, good and faithful servant, I'm pleased with you. The spirit of God testifies to your spirit when you're in step with him. And there's great joy, joy overflowing and beaming in that place. And so 1 Thessalonians 5, 8 tells us, since we belong to the day, in other words, since we have knowledge, there's light that's been given. We understand what God's will is. Jesus has made it very clear. This is my command. Nobody here should be in darkness. Everybody's part of the day. Nobody's going to be caught off guard come judgment day as to what was expected of you. Therefore, sober up. Wake up and do it. Prepare your heart to do it. Put on Notice that. This is a choice you make. You can put on, in Jesus' name, faith and love and hope. I'm going to put on the belief that God's word is true today. I'm going to decide that Jesus is right, 
And therefore, I'm going to put on love, and I'm going to decide today is not about Ben Walls and what I want. Today is about Jesus Christ and what he wants, and he wants me to serve other people the way that he served me. Even people that don't want to serve me back. Even people that get under my skin that don't want to be Christ to me. I'm going to love them the way that Christ has loved me because it's not about them. It's about him. And it's about the hope to come and the reward that he's promised me. Look at Jude 121. Keep yourselves in God's love. That's a choice that you make, is it not? Keep yourself there. Choose to put on faith, love, and the hope of eternal life ahead. That's a choice you get to make daily. Look at 1 Timothy 6, 11 through 13. Pursue, act on right living, godly living, Christ-like living, in other words. Pursue that. Pursue faith. Pursue love, endurance, gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of eternal life. Take hold of it. It's there for the taking. Who wants eternal life here today? You know the way? Take hold of it. It's not just this automatic thing that you sit back in the lazy boy and wait for him to suck you up to heaven. You're saved for a purpose, and it's to love as your love. So go ahead and take hold of it. Are you taking hold of it? In other words, here's another way to say it. Take hold of joy. Do the will of God. And when you fail, confess it and get back up and do it again. Don't overcomplicate this thing. Wake up every day, set your will to say, I believe that Jesus is right and true. I believe he's coming again. I believe that his way is life eternal. And so I'm going to pursue to honor him by being a servant to those around me. I'm going to put on love even if you put on hate. That's what it means to be an overcomer. How many times in the book of Revelation does it, God say, to those who overcome, I will give eternal life? It is not automatic. That's why Jesus says, if, 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 do not be deceived, those who live righteously are righteous. Those who do not are not. We got to sober up. Now, I don't know about, does that sober you up? Are you still glad you came to church today? Because I don't think, I don't know. I'm not feeling it. Let me quote two things. I don't even know what time. Oh, 11.28. Man, thank you, Jesus. All right. Two quotes on the overhead for you. Joy is what comes to us when we are walking in the way of faith and obedience. That's Eugene Peterson in memory of him who just passed away this week. Joy is what comes to us when we are walking in the way. You know that the first Christians were not called Christians. They were called a people of the way. In other words, we are walking in the way of Christ, which is in the way of being a humble servant to everyone around us. That's where joy comes. So in other words, here's the flip side of that coin. And you see, we feel entitled like this shouldn't be the case. If you're not walking in his ways and you're persisting in disobedience, there is no joy there. You will live a miserable existence. You will not be a blessing to others. So this is in response to that. Lisa Turkis, quote, Lord, here's a prayer for all of us. Lord, help me keep my mind parked on your promises in Scripture. Is that a good prayer? Is that a prayer God's going to answer that Jesus would assign his name off on? Lord, help me to keep my mind parked on your promises in Scripture instead of allowing myself to be bossed around by my feelings. Insult for insult, lust, overwhelmed by my schedule, bossed around by all these things other than the Word of God. So here's my stated premise one more time in closing. I want us to draw a line in the sand today, church, to fight the good fight of faith and stop being passive about our loss of joy. Stop being passive about your walk with God. 
Stop being passive about your free access to the Word of God every single day of your life. You can open this up freely and people shed their blood starting with Jesus for centuries to give you the privilege to know life and life everlasting. And we're so busy saturating our minds on other things. Is it any wonder we are known for a lack of joy and just overwhelmed with opiate crisis and everybody's on every drug except for Jesus today? But you have a choice to stop being passive, to take hold of salvation, to put on faith, to become a servant of the Most High God, to set your will there. And here's what I want you to know. The second that you turn, see, repentance is a change of mind that leads to a change of mind. The second that you change your mind and say, Jesus, I am done being passive. I'm done with my will being done. I'm going to, when I pray this, I'm going to mean it. Father, not my will, but your will be done. The Holy Spirit will meet you there and empower you to live that life. But you've got to set your will. You've got you to wake up and say, I'm going to fight the devil today. He's not just going to have his way with me and my emotions. And Jesus says this, when you set your will to live for the Father's glory, your will is then set to be my friend. <laughs> because that's what I live for. I live for my Father's glory. He who knows these things and does these things, Jesus says, is a friend of God. And your life will bear fruit. But you've got to get desperate for Jesus. He can't be an afterthought. He can't be just a convenient add-on. He's got to be the central piece of your life. And he is the living and abiding word of God. And he says, when my word remains in you, you and me, you can ask whatever you wish, and then set your will and your heart to obey my commands, and you will have my joy, joy that's full to overflowing. So I want you to stand with me now. And as the worship team comes, there's a psalm, Psalm 51, 12, where King David had gotten away from God. Here was a man after God's own heart who had lost his heart for God. Because he'd gotten out of step with God. He'd gotten lazy and passive in the things of God, and he let lust get the best of him. And lust ended up leading to murder, and next thing you know, his heart is calloused and far from God. And next thing you know, here was a man who was following hard after God's heart who has no heart for God anymore. But God loved him too much to not shake him up with Nathan. And in result, as the result of him having his eyes open to realize how far he had gotten from God, he prayed a prayer that I want some of you to pray with me right now that maybe you understand, man, I have gotten far from God. I have not been guarding my heart. I have not been guarding my joy. I've been very passive when it comes to the word of God at work in my life. I've not been seeking Jesus' help to put his word into practice. I want you to pray this prayer right now with me from Psalm 51, 12. Are you ready? You don't have to say it out loud. You can say it in your heart. If you want to say it out loud, go ahead and just say it out loud. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. <laughs> Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, we pray, restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. God, I can't do it on my own. Jesus, we take you at your word and we know in and of ourselves we can't bear fruit that's pleasing to the Father. We're not full of love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. In fact, just the opposite. And so we humble ourselves and we confess once again, God, in and of ourselves, we are sinners. But Jesus, we're believing in you that you are a great and mighty and powerful Savior who can energize us with your love, who can turn us from selfishness to selflessness. 
who can renew our hearts and our minds by the power of your word, whose Holy Spirit can bring to mind everything we need to overcome. And so God, get us desperate for you. Help us to fight the good fight. Help us to take hold of that for which you've taken hold of us. Forgive us for getting indifferent, for getting passive. Get us active again, Jesus, by the power of your Holy Spirit, that you might be glorified, that we might be image bearers again, reflecting your heart and your character and your love. Set our hearts to be servants. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen. You know, in this closing song, if you want any particular prayer, I just invite you to come to the altar.